All right. So I think that I know mostly everybody here, but if I don't, my name is Harrison Carmichael. I'm one of the PGY3 Emerge residents here in the Royal College stream. Um, are you guys hearing me okay on the mic? Awesome. Perfect. So as you guys can probably guess by the uh, title of my first slide, we're going to be talking about rapid atrial fibrillation today. This is a topic that's actually given me a lot of frustration through the first three, year, three years of my uh, residency so far. So I really wanted to take some time, go through all the evidence here today, and hopefully provide you guys with some new updates that might be practice changing in the future. So first things first, just conflicts of interest. So for me, I'm a dog owner. So Joey's going to be making some appearances throughout the course of my presentation today. If you like dogs, awesome, enjoy them. If you don't, whatever, you're fine. So otherwise, though, no one's actually paying me anything, so I have no conflicts of interest, interest to disclose. So our objectives for today. So we're going to review the new 2017 CAPE AFib best practices guidelines. We're going to review tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. We're going to talk a little bit about AFib and type 2 ACS, or supply-demand ischemia. And we're going to discuss the identification and the management of secondary atrial fibrillation. I've broken up my uh, presentation today into five different chapters. Um, so we're going to just go right in. We'll start with chapter one. It's shocking revelations in rhythm control. Yes, there are bad puns with every single one. So our first case, we have a 30-year-old male. He's presenting to your emergency department complaining of a racing heart for four hours. After a few days of heavy drinking, watching some really stressful Toronto Blue Jays playoff baseball games, we're going to go ahead and call this person Rob Suddy. So Rob says he's never had this sensation before. He has no chest pain. He's never had any shortness of breath. He has no other medical conditions. He has no allergies. And every once in a while, he says he dabbles with a bit of propranolol. Um, his heart rate, it's 140. His blood pressure is 167 over 94. His respirator is 16. His temp is 36.1. And his sats on room air are 99%. Here's his ECG. Now, most of us in here are emergency physicians. You can identify that this looks like pretty uncomplicated rapid atrial fibrillation. So what are we going to do? And I want to take a quick poll of the audience here. So how many people want to either chemically or electrically cardiovert Rob? Good. So the vast majority of people. How many people want to do a little bit of a rate control strategy? Good. I don't see a single hand, so perfect. Who wants to counsel Rob on the consequences of ETOH abuse? Yeah, again, everybody. That's great secondary prevention, guys. So well done. So I, I'm in totally on board with you guys. I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to sedate and shock Rob in this situation. <laughs> but what happens if it's the same patient? He's coming in, and his heart's been racing now for three days. What about if he's 70? It's been three days. He's got a little bit of CHF, and he's on metoprolol. How about he's 70? It's been 36 hours but he has diabetes, he has hypertension, and he's had a previous TIA. What are we going to do then? You can see that each one of these cases has its intricacies, um, and that it can be a little bit difficult to decide what's the most appropriate strategy. So if only we had some really smart people that could get together and provide us with a framework or maybe guidelines for what we could do in these situations. Well, fortunately, that's why we have CAPE, the Canadian Association of Emergency uh, Physicians, which, as I found out this year, is our 40th year. Um, they intermittently come together and provide updates and best practice guidelines on certain common presentations to the emergency department that may not have the most clear evidence or be something that's difficult to manage. This year, or I guess last year now, a group of 17 physicians as well as research personnel got together to review the literature, um, and they came out with a new set of guidelines. Now, these guidelines actually haven't even been published yet, so we're getting a bit of a sneak peek here today. They're going to be published in the very near future. They have been accepted into the publications. Of the emergency, of the physicians there, there's 10 emergency physicians, a number of cardiologists, as well as a thrombosis specialist, and three of our own physicians. So Dr. Warren Chung, Dr. Debbie Eagles, and, of course, Dr. Ian Steele. And on top of that, we actually had a number of our own research personnel who contributed to these guidelines as well. So with that said, let's dig in. Let's go and let's just go through these guidelines. So again, most of us are emergency physicians. We know that the first thing that we need to do when assessing somebody coming in with rapid atrial fibrillation is determine, is this a primary arrhythmia? Or is this secondary to a medical cause? If it's a primary arrhythmia, very simple. Is our patient stable or are they unstable? If they're unstable, you're looking for signs of shock. So hypotension associated with signs of poor perfusion. 
They list the systolic less than 90, but we know that some patients walk around with a systolic of 90. So you need that second uh, caveat, that lack of perfusion. Do they have cardiac ischemia? Are they coming in with crushing chest pain? Are there changes on the ECG? Are they in pulmonary edema? And again, not a touch of pulmonary edema. We're not talking about a little fine crackles at the basis. We're not talking about mild swelling to the feet. These are the true people coming in, gasping for air. They don't look well. If they're unstable, which is very uncommon, then you need to urgently electrically cardiovert these patients. We know that doesn't always work, so you can do a trial of rate control if that does fail, but we know that these patients are coming into the hospital. Now a little bit more difficult. What if the patient's stable? So again, most of us know we're gonna look and see who is at a high, term or a high risk for a short-term stroke. Ways that you can figure out if they're a low risk. So things that we know as well, an onset that's clearly less than 48 hours, or if they've been on a therapeutic oral anticoagulant for greater than or equal to three weeks. Now, you might look at this and say, hmm, less than 48 hours, but no high risk factors. Well, what are they talking about there? My teaching is that under 48 hours, go ahead, you can spark these people. Well, to go and to look into these high risk factors, you first have to know where did this under 48 hours come from? So this is my first grand rounds, and I kind of learned something interesting about grand rounds. You have a topic that you look into and you have something that you've been taught forever and you assume that it's gonna be well supported in literature. Everybody knows this, so there must be really good evidence to support it. You go to look through a few papers to find this quickly and five hours later and 20 papers later, you have no clue what's going on. That was essentially what happened to me with this. In the end, I asked somebody smarter than me and it turns out that this really came from expert opinion. Whenever we first started to implement rhythm control strategy in the emergency department, 48 hours was the consensus between cardiologists and emergency physicians as to where would be a safe threshold. We've never had a study that's actually specifically looked at patients cardioverted before 48 hours to after 48 hours and showing an increased risk. Because of this, some people have started to wonder if 48 hours is the right window. Should it be shorter? Should it be longer? And that's where this study comes into play. So this was a study that was published in JAMA in 2014. It was done by Noto and all. It was out of Finland. It was titled The uh, Time to Cardioversion for Acute Atrial Fibrillation with Thromboembolic Complications. What was this study? Well, it was a retrospective chart review of 5,116 cardioversions and 2,481 individual patients. How did they do it? Well, what they did was they took their patients and broke them up into three cohorts, zero to 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours, and 24 to 48 hours. They then looked at these patients and their primary outcome was thromboembolic complications within 30 days after electrical cardioversion. Now, thromboembolic complications included CVA, so stroke, but it also included other embolic complications, so mesenteric ischemia and acute ischemic limb. But whenever you look into this, the vast majority, greater than 85% of their complications were stroke. What did it show? Well, it showed that thromboembolic complications in patients cardioverted before 12 hours was 0.3%. So quite an impressively low number, something that I'm sure all of us in here are pretty happy with. Over 12 hours, it's 1.1%. So there is a jump. You might say 1.1%. Well, in the eMERGE, we're pretty happy with a 1% to 2% miss rate in a lot of populations. So why do I care about that? Well, this 1.1%, if you extend that risk from 30 days out to over a year, and then you compare it with that patient's risk based on the CHADS uh, risk factor scoring system, um, these patients are now at a higher risk per day of having a stroke than they would be if you left them in atrial fibrillation without anticoagulation. By the CHADS risk factor scoring system, most of these patients are gonna be somewhere between four and 10%. If you extend that 1% out over a year, it's gonna be greater than that. So that's an important thing to know. What about finding out risk factors with these patients that who's gonna have the stroke? How do, we, how do we determine who these people are? Well, what they did was they did a multivariate regression analysis looking at our CHADS risk factors. And what the CHADS risk factors are, we know, are CHF, so hypertension, in this study in age greater than 75, diabetes, or a history of stroke or TIA. The multivariate regression analysis showed that if you had two or more of these risk factors, these were the people in this study who are at a higher risk of having a stroke. So what do we take from it? Well, the bottom line from this study is that we need to start looking at patients a little differently. You may have an increased risk of stroke related to an electrical cardioversion if you've been cardioverted greater than 12 hours after the onset, and you have two or more of these CHAS risk factors. Now, I recognize that the guidelines say 24 hours. 
And I recognize that this isn't the best, the best study in the world. It's a retrospective chart review. We don't have a prospective study that's um, confirming these uh, findings as of yet. And that's the reason the guidelines tend to lean a little bit more past 12 hours out to 24 hours. We're very good at electrical cardioversion, and we need to still be able to do that in our emergency departments. So until these findings are confirmed, the guidelines are recommending that as long as somebody's within 24 hours, you're probably okay. But to be smart, to consider rate control in these patients coming in with risk factors greater than 24 hours. So now that we've gone through that, you've determined their low risk. You know to electrically or pharmacologically cardiovert these patients. They're going to be discharged home. You'll start an oral anticoagulant as per our Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines. What about if they're high risk? So your high risk population, these are patients who either haven't been on a therapeutic OAC for greater than three weeks. They have an onset that's unknown or greater than 48 hours. They have a stroke or a TIA within the last six months, or a mechanical or rheumatic heart valve. I want to point out those last two factors because I don't think that we consider them all the time. Patients with a stroke or TIA within the last six months who aren't on anticoagulation and therapeutically anticoagulated, or mechanical and rheumatic heart valves. Keep those in your mind, in the back of your mind, as a high-risk patient population. If you do determine someone's high risk for a stroke, then we're doing a rate control strategy. Our heart rate targets are 100 at rest. 110 with activity. Your other option, of course, is that if you can get it really quickly or admit them to hospital for a TEE guided cardioversion, that's also a very reasonable choice as well. Again, these patients will be discharged home. One thing to keep your eyes out for in the future is that we're actually, um, um, Dr. Sadik and Dr. Johnson at the General, developing a new onset AFib clinic. Their goal is to make this very similar um, to our rapid referral chest pain clinic that we have currently now. Their plan would be anybody who presents with the first presentation of AFib to the emergency department undergoes rate or rhythm control and has no previous contact with cardiology, they'll be appropriate for referral to this clinic where they'll get a Holter, they'll get an echo, and they'll be seen within a week if they've been had managed with a rate control strategy. This will provide timely follow-up, medication advice, and potential for electrical or um, TEE guided cardioversion as well in these patients. If it's been done a rhythm control strategy, these patients are a little lower risk. They'll be seen within a month to two, and they'll have the same test prior to seeing a cardiologist. So something that isn't developed yet, but hopefully coming down the pipes here soon. So what's our case outcome? Well, Rob consented to a conscious sedation. We shocked him. We used a little bit of propofol, and he reverted back to sinus rhythm. Um, he returned home to continue his eternal misery as a Toronto Blue Jays baseball fan and a semi-successful emergency medicine resident. So... On to chapter two, and I'm going to leave Rob alone from now on. Um, so this one's don't steal my main squeeze. So case two, a 66-year-old female um, presents with a history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. Um, she's come into the emergency department complaining of fatigue and exercise intolerance for a few days. Her, heart rate that or her vitals at triage are a heart rate of 145, a respirate of 22, her blood pressure is 132 on 68, her temp is 36.7, and her SATs are 97% on room air. Here's her ECG really shockingly similar to Rob's. And again, I think we can agree that this is probably rapid AFib without much in the way of complications. So what are we dealing with and what's our management gonna be this time? Well, since I just spoke about rhythm control, I'm assuming most of you can guess I'm gonna start talking about rate control. Now, for me, this is a full stop. This is where I wanna get everybody's attention back. So put your phones away, pay attention to me, give me 10 minutes of your time. This is the meat of my lecture here today. If you only listen to one part, this is what I want you guys taking home, okay? Now, before we go into that, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a rant alert. So I want to make a couple of points. The first is that rate control and rapid AFib and A flutter is bread and butter in an emergency department. We need to own this as a specialty. We see this first. We need to diagnose this. We need to be the best at treating this. We need to recognize when urgent treatment isn't necessary, and we need to identify that as well. Just because it's bread and butter, though, in the emergency department, that does not make us particularly good at this. I can walk to every single emergency physician in here, myself included, and talk to you about a time that one of us has either had a near miss or caused direct harm to a patient while trying to rate control people in the emergency department. Every person I've talked to about this has had an episode where they've had, um, had an adverse outcome or had a close call because of this. There's a reason for that. Rate control in AFib, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. This isn't a sprained ankle. This isn't a viral URTI. And it's not something that is simple for us or anybody to deal with. We're very good at a rhythm control strategy. 
Our Audubon aggressive protocol has made us very confident in this. And I think at times, our confidence with rhythm control can leak over into rate control. And they're two very, very different beasts. We need to recognize that. They're different beasts because our rate controlled drugs can be very dangerous. If I walk into uh, the emergency department and I'm getting hand over and Dr. Thurger tells me, yeah, it was a crazy shift. I had a beta blocker overdose. I had a calcium channel blocker overdose. I had someone who was dig toxic. My mind and everybody else's mind in here goes to sick patients. These people who come in, they make us nervous. And we should be careful with these drugs when we're giving them in such large doses over such small periods of time to patients who we don't have a full understanding of what exactly is going on with their physiology. Another reason is there's no perfect single approach. You can't cookie cutter this. You need to go in and you need to tailor your approach to your patient every single time. If you go in with the strategy that I'm going to give 10 milligrams of IV metoprolol to every patient, then they're going to get 50 milligrams PO and they're going to go home, you're going to harm somebody. You need to make sure that you are aware of what you're doing and the reasons you're doing it. That's the end of my rant, but respect AFib, you must. <laughs> so on to rate control. Um, so again, same as rhythm control, your first, um, your first item of action is determining, is this a primary arrhythmia or is it secondary to a medical cause? If it's a primary arrhythmia, we know that our first line agents are calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Now, I could do an entire grand rounds comparing the two of these and trying to convince you one way or the other. That's not the point of my rounds here today. If you're wondering which one to choose, I can't give you that information. You need to do a little bit of looking through on your own and determine what your practice is going to be. I can guide you a bit with the guidelines and say that if someone's on an oral calcium channel blocker or an oral beta blocker, stick to the same class. Don't mix them up. If you want to choose that, choose the same one that they're already on. For diltiazem, which is our calcium channel blocker of choice, the dose is 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. You're going to repeat that up to three times every 15 to 20 minutes. One thing I'd really like to point out is that the moment that you get adequate IV rate control, you want to start PO dosing within 30 minutes. This helps to prevent a rebound tachycardia that may prevent disposition home um, versus somebody who goes home and then has their heart rate pop up pop up to 120, 130, and they represent to the emergency department. Or even worse, they stay home with that heart rate. For beta blocker, it's metoprolol, 2.5 to 5 milligrams. Again, repeat up to three times every 15 minutes. And again, you want to start a low-dose beta blocker as well in the emergency department within 30 minutes of adequate rate control. Now, you may look at the calcium channel blocker and notice, avoid if acute heart failure or known LV dysfunction. Well, where does that actually come from? Why does this calcium channel blocker have this sort of caveat on it when a beta blocker doesn't? It's my understanding that both are quite heavily negatively ionotropic when given in IV formulations, and shouldn't both be avoided in heart failure? Well, whenever you, uh, again, are in grand rounds and you think you're asking yourself a really simple question that's got to be supported in literature, you're going down a wormhole, and five hours later you're going to ask somebody who's a lot smarter than you to figure this out for you. And that's what I did. So I spoke with our cardiology experts, and I spoke with some of our emergency physicians here to try and get to the bottom of this. And why is it that beta blockers are not listed as a contraindication in heart failure? The most recent study that I looked at in 2015 in the Annals of Internal Medicine comparing these two showed more rapid onset to adequate rate control with calcium channel blockers. If it's leaning towards calcium channel blockers in that study, you would think that they wouldn't include heart failure patients, but they did. Their only exclusion criteria was an NYHA class four heart failure patient. So they included one to three. As you know, three could be pretty severe heart failure. That can be affecting people quite a bit. If calcium channel blockers were more dangerous than heart failure, shouldn't we see a trend of safety towards beta blockers? Well, it turns out that whenever you talk to cardiology about this, this seems to be the literature that this stems from. So this study here, this is the md pit trial. This was published in circulation in 1991. It was done by Goldstein et al. It was a large, randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study looking at diltiazem versus placebo in patients with chronic heart failure undergoing a rate control strategy. What did it show? Well, it showed that diltiazem hurts these people. Decreased LV function, increased morbidity and mortality. Therefore, the American Cardiology Society has a class one recommendation to avoid um, calcium channel blockers in patients with chronic heart failure. So why in the emergency department would we treat them with a calcium channel blocker when that's what they would go home with? It doesn't make sense. So that's why that's part of the reason that we don't do it. What about beta blockers? Well, the great thing about the cardiology literature is they have a lot of money, and they have some really well-done studies. 
All three of these studies are large, multi-center, randomized, placebo-controlled studies. The first one is published in circulation. This is the CBIS trial. Um, this was published in 1994. This looked at bisoprolol in chronic heart failure management. The second in circulation in 2002 by Packer et al. This was the Copernicus study. This was looking at carvedilol in uh, patients with heart failure. The MD or the Merit Heart Failure Study was looking at extended release metoprolol, and this was published in The Lancet in 1999. Every single one of these studies showed that a beta blocker in chronic therapy for people who are in heart failure improves morbidity, improves mortality and functional outcomes for these patients. So, in the emergency department, if you were going to choose one, then therefore beta blocker sounds like a good choice. What's the issue with this? These aren't our patients. This isn't our population. None of these trials were on rapid atrial fibrillation in the emergency department. Interestingly enough, none of these trials were specifically on atrial fibrillation to begin with. They were mainly on patients who are in sinus rhythm. There's some new evidence in the cardiology literature that says that the beta blocker uh, morbidity and mortality benefits may not even be there whenever you're investigating a purely atrial fibrillation cohort. So what do we do with that? Well, Whenever we start talking about this, we need to look and see if there's studies comparing the inotropy of negative, or the negative inotropy of IV calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, and that study does not exist. We do not know if calcium channel blockers are more negatively inotropic than beta blockers, but the general consensus in the cardiologists that I spoke to is that they're probably equally negatively inotropic when given in an IV formulation as a push dose. Now, one other thing that I hear in the emergency department quite not uncommonly from a number of physicians is, well, I don't want to give them a push dose because it's very negatively onotropic. So put it in a mini bag, run it in over 15 to 20 minutes. Stop doing that. That, that makes no difference whatsoever. The dose is the same. The only difference you're going to get is a delay in onset to that peak dose from the two minutes that you gave it as a push to the 15 minutes you ran it in a mini bag. 13 minutes later, that same patient will still become hypotensive. So it is not a way to decrease the negative inotropy of these medications. That's something we need to stop doing. It doesn't make sense. If you're doing it for other reasons, that's fine. But if you're doing it as a way to avoid um, negative inotropy, that's not going to work. So you may be saying, Harrison, so I can't use IV calcium channel blockers. I can't use beta blockers in heart failure. What should I do? Well, the recommendations from the uh, best practices guidelines is that digoxin is considered first-line therapy for hypotension and heart failure. Now, emergency physicians, we know the data with digoxin in long-term management with, uh, in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. It doesn't improve your mortality outcomes. But it is a medication that is a cardiac glycoside. It improves your uh, contractility. It will avoid hypotension in these patients. Um, you do have to be cautious, of course, in renal failure. Patients with end-stage renal disease, a loading dose of digoxin is known to stay in the system for at least a week. So if you're giving a medication like this to someone like that, you need to know that it's staying around. You can probably give it in patients with a little bit of renal insufficiency, someone with a small AKI, without much in the way of consequences. But you need to be aware of your patients with chronic renal failure. Now, sure, it's recommended as a first line in hypotension and heart failure. At our m and rounds a couple of weeks ago, I guess a couple of months ago now, the question came up, well, what about digoxin and cardioversion? If I'm doing a rate control strategy, I know that digoxin in the past has been looked at as a rhythm control medication. Why would I want to convert someone to sinus rhythm when that's not my goal? And that's a great question. It's a question I went and looked at. So in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1987, so yes, before I was born, Falk et al. published a study. It was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled study looking at um, rapid, uh, rapid atrial fibrillation, actually in emergency department patients. What it showed was that it com comparing digoxin to placebo for a rhythm control strategy, the rates of conversion were actually not significantly different. Both converted about 45 to 50% of their patients in this study. That seems a bit high. What about the European Heart Journal in 1995 by who et al.? This was a study, it was actually a comparison study looking at uh, um, amiodarone versus digoxin, again, for rhythm control strategy. Um, and I believe this was also in the emergency department. Small study, what it showed was that amiodarone in this population worked really well, close to 90%. And DIG converted about 71% of the patients. Again, that's pretty high. What about calcium channel blockers and beta blockers? Well, a study published in the Journal of Cardiovascular Pharmacological Therapy in 2007 uh, by Hassan et al., and this was done in Michigan, was looking at Esmolol comparing it to diltiazem. 
Now, the conversion rates in this population for esmolol were 39%, and diltiazem is 42%. That's not what we're seeing. These studies aren't applicable to our population because we practice differently than place, other places in the world. Americans tend to trend towards a rate control strategy, and so do other places in the world. We are much more aggressive with our rhythm control. There's not a study that really looks at the, sin or at the um, uh, conversion to sinus rhythm in Canadian populations in patients presenting with, um, presenting with heart failure, or sorry, presenting with atrial fibrillation who get digoxin. So we don't actually know what the conversion in our population is for digoxin to, um, to sinus rhythm in comparison to beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. The consensus is you probably do get a little bit more. It makes sense. It's something that we've seen anecdotally. Most people will say you get a little bit more cardioversion. However, it's a risk-benefit analysis. The risk of causing someone severe hypotension and potentially harming them is probably greater than the small increased risk of stroke that somebody's getting from that conversion to sinus rhythm. And it's got to be a case-to-case -case basis that you really analyze these patients. There is some evidence that we can't go into today just for time constraints that adding a very low-dose PO beta blocker or adding IV magnesium with your loading dose of digoxin may actually increase its efficacy and its, uh, how rapidly it actually achieves your rate, uh, rate uh, control targets. But that's something that if you want a little more information about, you can talk to me about afterwards. Yes, Dr. Steele? Very much so, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're not giving the jocks Yes. Correct. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. so just to clarify my point. So my point in that situation was that there's a concern that when giving digoxin with the intended, um, intended uh, goal of rate control, um, that you would unintentionally then get people converting to sinus rhythm at a rate more so than what you would like. So my goal with showing those studies was to show to you that we don't actually have evidence to show that it increases your conversion to sinus rhythm. We don't actually know. The consensus is that you probably do get a bit more conversion, but if you're going to use digoxin for rate control, you're doing a risk benefit where you're accepting that slightly higher increased risk of conversion to sinus rhythm to avoid the hypotension. And you are, this is in patients you're using and ideally would like to go ahead and use a rate control strategy. I've never seen a Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> it is. I do, I do. And in discussion with our cardiologists, they do agree that some of the studies that I was hoping to discuss today and just unfortunately didn't have the time to fit it in, um, they said that it's something we can consider, especially in patients whose magnesium uh, it presents with magnesium that's low. But we, we can go into that a little bit more afterwards if you would like. So, <laughs> so our cardiology colleagues, so in discussing this patient population, so rapid atrial fibrillation and heart failure, what do they want us to do with these patients? In general, the consensus is they want us to refer these patients along. These are patients that they actually want to see, whether it's new heart failure or patients presenting with chronic heart failure. They tend to want to see these patients in the emergency department because they need closer follow-up they may be the ones that then can risk stratify these patients and send them home if they would like. But the general consensus is that if someone's presenting with heart failure in these patient population, then they would like to see them. Cardio's practice, it varies from ours. They will admit, they will anticoagulate, they will do a TEE and a cardioversion in some of these patients with heart failure. They're going to use digoxin. And in some cases, they'll start a very low-dose PO beta blocker and up titrate from there. The big consensus that they said is that these are not patients who are appropriate for IV calcium channel blockers or IV beta blockers, and they want to really reiterate that to us. So on to chapter three. I like to call this the Nick Prudhomme effect, so this is going too fast for too long. Um, so this is actually a real case. This is a case that presented to our emergency department just a couple of months ago now. It's a 66-year-old male. He's presenting with a one-month history of exertional shortness of breath. There's some fatigue, there's some weakness. He feels, he feels generally unwell. And during this time, he's had intermittent chest pressure. His vitals had triage, so he had a heart rate of 190, he has a respirate of 24, he has a blood pressure of 130 over 103, and he has uh, SATs of 96% on room air. His JVP, for some reason, an emergency doctor actually documented it, was 3 to 4 centimeters ASA. He had no pedal edema, otherwise normal exam, 
His past medical history is significant for lung cancer. He's in remission. He's not undergoing treatment. He had COPD, hypertension, hep C. His medications, not anything that super, super uh, jumps off the page at you there. His investigation, so his white blood cell counts, 23.7. His creatinine's 173. Baseline's in the 90s. His TNI initially is 92. His lactate's 3.5. So somebody that you'd be a little bit concerned about. Those aren't the most reassuring numbers. His chest X-ray is normal. Here's his ECG. <laughs> so again, pretty, pretty easy for us at this point. I actually looked at this patient's ECG. Very similar. It was uncomplicated, heart rate at 170, and a very obvious rapid atrial fibrillation. So I'd like to take a poll of the audience now. We've gone through the first two chapters. Let's see what we've learned, and let's see what people are going to do. So let's have hands up. Who's going to give IV diltiazem? Good. Nobody. Perfect. Oh, sorry. Who's going to give some uh, IV metoprolol? Okay. So we've got a, got a couple of people raising their hand. Who's given IV dig? Okay. No takers in IV digoxin. What about PO metoprolol? So no takers for PO metoprolol. Who's doing some sort of combination of these therapies? Anybody taking that? Who's doing absolutely nothing? All right. So the R3 year <laughs> apparently is going to do absolutely nothing. And we don't have a lot of takers for other options. So that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very, very good question. What I'm talking about here is actually a case, this is a case of tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So this may be the first time that some people have actually heard the term tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Some of you may have heard about it, but not know too, too much about it. So what is it? So it's a reversible cardiomyopathy that re presents with ventricular dysfunction that on echocardiogram looks very similar to a dilated cardiomyopathy. The onset tends to take weeks. So this doesn't happen over the course of hours. It doesn't happen over the course of days. The general consensus is that this requires two to three weeks of someone going fast for you to be able to actually uh, go in and develop tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. <coughs> Classically, and this is a bit counterintuitive, it actually presents in patients with slower tachydysrhythmias. The reason for this is if your heart rate's going 180, 190, you're going to feel that. You're not going to feel well. You're going to come to an emergency department, usually within the first few days. If you're going 120, 130, 140, you may be able to tolerate this and think, oh, I just feel unwell. And these patients will stay home and grumble along for a few weeks before presenting. So classically, that's the patient population we're going to see this in. A study done here at the Heart Institute in 2009 by Bernie et al. Um, looked at the incidence of tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy in the patients with chronic A-flutter who are undergoing an ablation for their A-flutter. What they found was 14% of their patients who are undergoing a chronic rate control strategy for their A-flutter um, were presenting with tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, a reversible cardiomyopathy. Whenever they did a multivariate regression analysis, the only thing that they identified as a risk factor for this was their ventricular rate. If they were on a rate control strategy and they were not adequately rate controlled and they were going at around 120 as opposed to under 100, these were the patients who were at risk of developing this. Why do we care? Well, these are high risk patients. These are patients with occult heart failure. So patients who come in with subtle signs of heart failure that if you don't go and see these patients, you may not actually pick up. They have new onset heart failure, so they don't come in on your heart failure cocktail that you look at and identify. There's no follow-up with a cardiologist saying that they have heart failure. These are patients with new onset heart failure. Aggressive treatment with IV calcium channel blockers and beta blockers in these patients can be life-threatening, and they can result in cardiogenic shock. This is a patient population that our usual care, if we're not careful, could kill somebody. If you don't appreciate that subtle heart failure, these are patients that will not tolerate these medications. So now that I've scared you a bit, how do we identify TIC? Well, the big thing is we actually need to spend some time with our patients in these cases. Take a history. Is there symptoms? Are they not sudden onset? Do they not feel their palpitations? Is this a subacute course? Have they been unwell for three weeks, a month? Um, do they have a known history of permanent AFib? Maybe they're not as compliant with their medications or haven't been able to over the last few weeks. Is there any signs of new CHF? On exam, go in, lay hands on their patients. I know I'm encouraging emergency physicians to take time out of our busy schedules and get in and lay hands on them, but we need to in this patient population. 
feel their extremities? Are they cool? Do they look like they have a little bit of low-grade shock? Do they have a narrow pulse pressure, like in this case, 130 over 103? Do they have a, are they a little bit confused, maybe delirious? If they have a Foley in, are they producing urine like they should be? On, exam, or on your labs, add in some LFTs, add in a lactate, add in a gas. Look for those subtle signs that you can pick up on uh, your investigations. And then a plug for ultrasound. This is the best modality for this. If you can, go in and generate your good cardiac windows. Take a look at what their heart's doing. Get a real-time visualization of that cardiac function, but know your skill level. If you can't generate those images, if you don't feel comfortable interpreting them, call a friend. Have your cardiologist come in if you suspect this could be the case. Ask somebody else in the emergency department who's competent with ultrasound to go and do that. But this is something we need to develop and we need to become better at. What do you do when you expect it? These patients need to be referred. They need to be admitted, and you need to step away from them. They're going fast, but they've been going fast for weeks. There is no rush in these patients to slow them down. A few more hours is not going to hurt them. The treatment is to slow them down, but it's to slow them down over a period of time after you've assessed their uh, left ventricular function. The treatment is either generally a slow up titration of a PO beta blocker using some digoxin, or just admitting, getting a TEE, ruling out a left atrial appendage thrombus, and then cardioverting these patients. They're going to require a long admission. These are usually pretty sick people. Their heart rate and their function of their LV does not bounce back right away. They're usually admitted for weeks. They get repeat echoes, and they require lots of follow-up. So what happened in our case? Well, he was given 5 milligrams of IV metoprolol. He was given 50 milligrams of PO metoprolol at the same time, and his blood pressure dropped to 64 over 40. Fortunately, responded to some fluids. Systolic came up to the 90s, close to 100. He was referred to medicine and cardio. If you specifically look at the medicine and cardio notes by the juniors on overnight that night, it said the patient does not tolerate beta blockade. Renal insufficiency cannot use uh, digoxin. Therefore, we will treat with amiodarone. He was given amiodarone. He converted to sinus rhythm. They got an echo the next day. What did the echo show? Now, unfortunately, my echo isn't working on our presentation today. But what it showed was global LV dysfunction. His heart is barely moving. He has an ejection fraction of less than 15%. If you look specifically on this, the left atrial appendage, which is the area with the little green, that's a thrombus. So he has a clot in his left atrial appendage. So what does that mean? Well, this patient was put on a DOAC. He was anticoagulated. And unfortunately, within a week, he had had an ischemic stroke. He had a left P2, he had a left M2 cut off. He is still admitted, actually, to neurology with pretty significant visual field deficits as well as speech deficits. So you can see how this person, he may have had a stroke down the line, he may not have, but our management directly affects the management of our colleagues. And if we recognize these patients, we can potentially prevent adverse outcomes and we can make sure that we're safer. Chapter four, so my achy breaky heart. So this case is a 76-year-old female, history of permanent AFib, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. Felt unwell for three to four days. Now she's a little bit short of breath, feels weak. Um, she's had some intermittent chest pressure during this time. Her vitals, you can see there, heart rate 145, breast rate of 18, blood pressure 112 over 68. Her temp's 37.4, SATs are 95% on room air. It's the general, you're slammed, it's emergent care. You notice that the blood work comes back already, and she's got a trope of 201. Her baseline is normal. Cardio's sitting right next to you. You sort of give them, a, give them a shout, but they're not going to be able to get to this patient for hours. Your op service R1 says, hey, shouldn't we slow her down a bit, control her, uh, reduce her myocardial demand? It's a good question. It's an annoying question, but it's a good one. So what do we do with AFib and ACS? Well, the simple answer to this is really go in again and look at your patient. Spend some time with these people. If you think this is a type 1 ACS, so a primary coronary thrombus, then you should treat it as such. So you want to give ASA to Cagrelor. You're going to anticoagulate these patients. The atrial fibrillation is secondary in this case, and we do not actively treat that. If you think the patient is unstable because this is a primary arrhythmia, then again, this goes down the unstable part of our guidelines, and we need to cardiovert this patient. So that would be somebody with ECG changes, chest pressure, onset after your um, AFib has started. If they're in CHF, as we just spoke about, you need to be careful. Talk to your consultants about this. And if you think it's a true type 2 ACS, so that supply demand ischemia, where the heart rate is causing an increased oxygen demand that the blood supply cannot keep up with, then the general consensus from our cardiology colleagues is ignore that first trope. 
as, treat, as per our guidelines, a true type 2 ACS is not going to cause global LV dysfunction, and you're not going to get yourself into trouble in this patient population because of that. After you've gotten the good rate control, do a 0, 3, 6 hour trending troponin, look for a plateau. If you find a plateau, amazing. Discharge these patients home and refer them to cardiology as an outpatient. These patients have failed the stress tests in our emergency department, and they have required now some more provocative testing as an outpatient. If that troponin continues to increase, then they've really failed that stress test. These are patients that are a higher risk as per the cardiology literature, and these are patients cardiology wants to see in-house for consideration of um, admission and risk stratification. So that's something that's very clear that they want us to do. If they have ACS and they have some subtle signs of heart failure and you don't want them to continue going fast because you're scared that it's going to be causing myocardial damage, the general consensus, again, is treating with PO, uh, or treating with an IV load of digoxin, if applicable, or a very, very low dose of a PO beta blocker, 12.5 to 25 milligrams. Um, these patients should all be referred to cardio in this situation as well. What was our case outcome here? Well, she was treated with 5 milligrams of IV metoprolol. It was thought to be a type 2 ACS. Um, her heart rate dropped down to 80. She had good rate control. She went home on a PO, uh, increased PO dose of her 50 milligrams that she was on before. It was increased up to 75. She was told to follow up with her cardiologist. And all this happened after the troponin at three hours came back at 315, and then it hit a plateau at six hours. She was discharged home. She saw her cardiologist, and things went well for her. Finally, the last chapter. So I'm being forced to do it. So this is a 66-year-old female. The history of AFib, CHF, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. Sounds like a peach. Complaining of myalgias, chills, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting for a few days now. Generally just feeling really unwell. Her vitals has a heart rate of 145, has a respirator of 22, blood pressure is 104 over 58, her temp is 38.1, her SATs are 96% on room air. On exam, mild bibasilar crackles, right, greater than left, increased work of breathing, no increased work of breathing. Her meds you can see there, apixaban, metoprolol, ramipril, crestor, metformin, and Lasix. Now, I'm going to throw you off. This is a different ECG. So this one actually looks a little bit like atrial flutter, but again, uncomplicated. And as Dr. Vinecor uh, astutely mentioned earlier, you start thinking about, is this patient septic? Well, in this case, we're talking about secondary AFib. This is where we're talking about not a primary arrhythmia as their presentation to the emergency department, but that this atrial fibrillation is secondary to a medical cause. This patient's probably a little bit septic. She's probably dry. She needs fluids. And that's likely what's driving her atrial fibrillation here, not that she's presenting to the emergency department with a fever and everything that's been generated by her AFib. That's not the case. Whenever you have this, stop right there. No rhythm control, no rate control. You are going to harm your patient. You are not doing benefit in these cases. Ways to pick this up, we know all this. Look for things like fever, dyspnea, pain, a heart rate less than 150, known permanent AFib. Maybe they're on some uh, anticoagulants already. They have uh, no sudden onset. Again, no palpitations. Things like sepsis can cause this. Bleeding can cause this. PEs, heart failure, ACS, anything can cause this. Why don't we just cardiovert these patients? I've seen it done a couple of times in our emergency department. Someone comes in with a PE, they flip to AFib, they get a cardioversion, they go back into, back into sinus rhythm, and all is great. Well, the people who deal with this the most are probably our ICU colleagues. You can imagine they don't normally see atrial fibrillation as a primary reason for somebody to show up in an ICU. If they have AFib in the ICU, it's going to be due to a second, or secondary to a medical cause. A couple of studies, and these were essentially prospective cohort studies, looking at the efficacy of a car electrical cardioversion in the ICU. One was published in 2003 in Critical Care Med and one in 2012 in the Journal of Critical Care. And these were looking at patients who had secondary AFib, electrical cardioversion, two sinus rhythm in the, emer or in the ICU. What it showed was that in the first study, 35% of these patients were successful in converting from AFib to sinus rhythm at all with electrical cardioversion. The second study showed 27%. Of these patients who actually converted to sinus rhythm, only 13% and 16% respectively stayed in sinus rhythm at 24 hours. They underwent a procedural sedation and electrical cardioversion for only about 13 and 16% of them staying in the sinus rhythm. Management in the ICU, it's highly different than what we do in the emergency department. They're heavily reliant on amiodarone. Same thing on the wards. And this is a medication that we should not be initiating in the emergency department and not a medication that we're comfortable with and using in many situations. 
So I would advocate that we step away and we don't even consider treating these patients, and that's backed up by what the guidelines say. Cardioverting these patients, they're not going to stay in it. You can treat the underlying cause and use that as treatment for your AFib. These studies, the generally on discharge from the second study that we have here, 82% of those people left the ICU in sinus rhythm um, once their underlying illness was treated. So although we want to do something, we want to address that rate, we're not helping them by trying to treat the AFib. We should be focusing on treating that underlying illness. Dave Harnett, one of our uh, cardiology fellows, gave me this quote whenever I was talking to him about this, and I really like how he, he frames it. So the concept of secondary atrial fibrillation is an important one. I believe that we need to think of it as truly secondary instead of simply focusing on the heart rate alone. In comorbid and ill uh, patients, we're not surprised when there's delirium or AKI, for example. And generally, we don't rush to implement a shotgun approach to address these secondary issues unless there's an acute concern. We should think the same way about AFib. Who knows exactly where the threshold for treatment or intervention should be? But similar to our management of these other secondary conditions, perhaps leaving well enough, up, uh, well enough alone up front may be appropriate in patients with secondary AFib without high-risk features. He's right. Whenever someone comes in with sepsis and they're a little bit delirious, they have a little bump in their uh, creatinine, they have an AKI, we're not rushing to address those issues. We're treating the underlying illness, and in that we're treating the AKI. We're treating the delirium. Antibiotics and fluids are the treatment for that it should be looked at the same way for atrial fibrillation. You're not going to harm these patients by leaving them going a little bit fast while you initiate the appropriate therapies, but you may harm them by trying to address that secondary issue and not focusing your efforts more on the primary issue. So a quick recap just to the five chapters. So the first one was rhythm control. Greater than 24 hours, more than two, two or more chas risk factors, you should be considering these patients for potential for rate control. Also consider patients with a mechanical heart valve or a recent stroke to be a bit of a higher risk. Um, for rate control, if there's no signs of CHF, calcium channel blockers and beta blockers are your first line therapy. You want to start PO medication very quickly within 30 minutes of adequate rate control. There's no difference in between giving a push or a mini bag. So if you're doing it to reduce the negative inotropy, that's not something that's going to benefit your patients. Do not give IV calcium channel blockers or beta blockers um, to patients who are presenting with CHF. DIG is first line in these patients and then patients who are hypotensive. And you can consider adding a little bit of IV magnesium or a low dose PO beta blocker to these patients. In terms of uh, heart failure and AFib, refer these patients along to cardiology. For tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, you have to have a high suspicion or you're going to miss this. You need to go in and you need to spend time examining and talking to your patients. The onset takes weeks for this. So this, if someone comes in with three-day history of palpitations, that's not going to be card, uh, TIC. A couple of weeks, subacute course, then it may be. I want everyone to walk away from here with atrial flutter, a heart rate less than 150, subacute course, and any signs or symptoms of new onset heart failure. That is tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy until proven otherwise. You want to refer these patients, and when you refer them, let the resident especially overnight, who's taking your consult, know that this is what you're concerned about and let them know the reason so they don't go and, add and attempt to rate control very quickly in these patients. You can initiate some therapy with, PO or with IV digoxin or a very low-dose PO metoprolol or beta blocker. That tends to be cardiology's approach initially. But don't feel bad if you don't want to do that. That's fine. There's no rush. For type 2 ACS, if it's type 1 ACS, treat the type 1 ACS and ignore the secondary AFib for the time being. Cardiovert them if they're unstable from that primary arrhythmia. If it's a type 2 ACS, then you're ignoring the troponin. You're going to trend that afterwards. If they plateau, you're going to send them home. If it does not plateau, you're going to refer them to cardiology in-house. For secondary AFib, recognize the etiology. You do not treat secondary AFib. You treat the underlying cause, and that is your treatment for secondary AFib. And I want us to walk away with that um, thought in mind here today. Allow our admitting services to really deal with this. They're more comfortable with it. They have more time. They can sit down and spend a lot more time thinking about and dealing with these patients than we're able to in the emergency department. So there's no rush. Let them deal with it. And that's about it. So I'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Steele, who is my supervisor for the, uh, these rounds. I'd like to thank Dr. Ian Steele for giving me access to the new CAPE guidelines and, of course, for his uh, expertise on the subject.
Dr. Mo Sadek and Dr. Joel Nisnik at the uh, General Hospital related to cardiology. Um, Dr. Dave Harnett, who is a cardiology fellow here over at the Heart Institute, as well as Dr. Kyle Murphy, who's an ICU fellow here at the uh, Civic in general. I'd like to thank my fiance, Grace Cook, and of course, Joey, for not having many playtimes over the last month, but learning a lot about tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Anyway, so we can open up for some discussion and uh, questions.